So it's not fair to say, well, do you know what? The DUP, take it or leave it, in or out. Well, sorry, I don't understand that because um, I think what John was talking about was inclusion. Mm -hmm. Who's excluded the DUP? Well, I can tell you who's excluded the DUP, the DUP themselves. Do, do you know what people really think? I'll tell you what people really think, why the DUP aren't going to the government. They don't think it's anything to do with the protocol. I don't know what the real reason is. But I think a lot of people think it's because there's going to be a first minister from a nationalist perspective. There is not the money for the, for the transformation that is needed to transform our health service. We're just not bothered. So it's important. Is that the position? No, but seriously, is that, is, that, is that the position? We it's very it. hard, so we're not going to bother. So, Good morning, my friends, and I do hope you all had a wonderful weekend. Now, that was DUP MP Colin Lockhart getting into a fascinating and sometimes quite heated debate with SDLP leader Colin Eastwood in last week's Northern Ireland Affairs Committee meeting on the effectiveness of the institutions of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. A truly fascinating debate between these two. So, just going to ask you guys, who do you think is more in the right here? Thank you, and thank you, Colin, for your uh, evidence this morning. It's been quite measured and uh, still a little well, I'm, bit... I'm always measured. A little bit uh, DUP-obsessed, but... Yeah. Um, uh, that's 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 nothing new, I suppose, and that's politics. Um, I suppose there is the perception quite often that uh, there is an intolerance for the unionist uh, viewpoint, particularly on on a number of issues. Um, and I want to just walk through them and uh, ask you for your response on them. Um, obviously, the big issue you've talked about uh, protocol and, and uh, the Windsor framework and the DUP and what they're asking for. What we're asking for is solutions. We want solutions for our businesses that are impacted by the protocol. Um, you only have to look at manufacturing, agriculture, uh, all of those different industries, which are absolutely key pillars within our uh, uh, country. Uh, and for the prospering of our country. Uh, so we want solutions for them. Surely you as an individual and as a very active public rep see that we need solutions for them. And whilst you say um, Stormont can resolve those issues, these issues sit very firmly within the UK government's gift. And it is important that you recognise that and that we get those solutions because we see, if uh, we see very clearly, by sitting in Stormont uh, for over a year trying to get solutions, we've got nowhere. It wasn't until the DUP took action that we actually made some progress around the Windsor framework. What solutions do you want, though? So the solutions are that there is that Northern Ireland's place within the UK's internal market is restored, and that there is. Um, you know, you only have to look at horticulture. We can't get. I've had emails in this week. They still can't get trees from GB to Northern Ireland. It's impacting trade. You look at the veterinary medicines issue. There are lots of issues that are really impacting businesses in Northern Ireland. So, um, I think it's important that you recognise those. And and to be quite honest, in relation to um, the the protocol and the winter framework, it does to the unionist community seem that you're quite happy for there to be a border down the Irish Sea, but not one on the island of Ireland. And none of us support I, I, one so, on the island so, of Ireland. So I think it's important that you use the opportunity just to reaffirm that, that you want to see a resolve on those issues. Well, I suppose I'm one of the people who argue most strongly to not have economic borders anywhere. I'm a real believer in the customs union and the single market. I suppose unlike your own party, um, where you've argued for us to be pulled out of those institutions, which were the biggest take us out of the biggest trading block on the planet um, and not recognising that, uh, that, that there are two parts of the island of Ireland. One part's in the single market and customs union and the other part isn't. Um, or wouldn't be, I suppose, if, if the DUP had got their way. So I, I kind of, I just think it's very hard to square. And it's not about nationalists, where we want to draw a border. I don't want a border anywhere. Um, it's about the practical reality of trade that we have a 300 mile border with 300 border crossings and it's not just one but sometimes you listen to people in the chamber not that far away from here you think it's just one big motorway that you can control i mean these are back roads and country roads and i just i, I genuinely anyway i i think it, it, it the dup's position has made absolutely no sense i i, I recognize of course there are issues there there 
their impositions that result in leaving a trading block. I think that was kind of what we were saying during the referendum um, campaign. And we w have worked very diligently with the British government, with the Irish government, with the European Union to try to resolve a lot of those issues that you say. I think most people in manufacturing think it's a very good thing, actually, the ones are framework that the opportunity to trade uh, across the world as a result of basically being back in the single market is a very good thing. I think agri in terms of agriculture, well, you know, a, a large parts of the agricultural industry were doing all Ireland uh, co-ops long before the Good Friday Agreement even was created because they understood the, the benefits in terms of raw numbers um, for working in that particular way. And uh, leaving the European Union uh, is not a very good thing for the agriculture uh, industry, in my view. But look, as I've said, we are open to listening and we're trying to give space. But there comes a moment, very soon I think, that the British government are going to have to say to the DUP, you're either in or you're out, because this doesn't make, like, I mean, wh what more do you want? And I think the Windsor framework was a victory for the DUP and you should take it and run with it. Um, I've heard the, some discussions around the, the sidelines about uh, the DUP wanting something strong on the Union and on uh, the fact that Northern Ireland will remain part of the United Kingdom. Well, as somebody who wants to change that, I can guarantee you that we won't support anything that uh, removes the consent principle. It's written in stone, as far as I'm concerned. That, the good, that as the Good Friday Agreement says, we won't have constitutional change unless a majority of people, both North and South, change it. There's no greater guarantee. There's no piece of paper that Rishi Sunak can write on that gives you a greater guarantee than that. The consent principle, which of course was always a unionist demand, is enshrined uh, in the Good Friday Agreement. And from a nationalist who wants to change it, um, I'm telling you that we will never support that being removed. There is no greater guarantee. There's nothing that Rishi Sunak can do that will guarantee uh, your place in the United Kingdom as long as people want it to be. Um, so, I mean, let's see. I hope, I, hope there are, I hope there's a resolution soon. I don't think this is sustainable. And I think the DUP's position is becoming very hard to understand. Surely the consent principle is being undermined when Hi. you want to push the, the views of the unionist community. In fact, all unionist MLAs, all unionist parties do not uh, agree with uh, the imposition of the protocol. That's and not what the framework. consent principle is about. No. So, because I've, heard this, I've heard this said um, by DUP representatives and the DUP leader, that the consent principle is somehow about everybody agreeing with everything. It's not what it's about. Because no, I want to put this on record, the consent principle is fairly basic and fairly simple. It was a unionist demand for decades. The consent principle is solely about the constitutional position of Northern Ireland. And it means that the people of Northern Ireland and the people of the Republic of Ireland in a concurrent referenda will decide the future of Northern Ireland constitutionally. It doesn't mean that on every single issue in the Northern Ireland Assembly or anywhere else that we all have to agree. I was there for nine years. I don't remember ever having consensus. Consensus and consent are two different things. Um, I don't give my consent to be part of the UK, but I recognise that the majority do. So I have to live with that until I can convince people to change that. That's what consent means. And there has been a confusion, in my view, a deliberate confusion about what the consent principle actually is about. Um, but that aside, I do want the DUP to feel comfortable with what the changes that have been made, but there are only so many more changes that can be made, and the EU and the British government have been absolutely clear as, as, lately as, as, as recently as uh, Saturday in Oxford, where the Secretary of State said, we will not be reopening uh, the Windsor framework. So, and I, I'll also say this, um, my in my involvement in politics and in the SDLP's involvement in politics over the past five decades, you don't sit back and ask people for solutions, you come up with them yourself. So in relation to then, obviously, you're um, now wading in with, again, the suggestions of, of Dublin interfering in the internal uh, affairs of Northern Ireland. Um, surely that... Irish agreement, so, so you're basically saying, you know, threaten the DUP with this and it'll hopefully... Uh, 
moves and negotiations on. Well, again, I remind you, they don't uh, really. Uh, well, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened when Ian Paisley went into government with Martin McGuinness. That's in, exactly what happened. In relation then to um, uh, around the. Oh gosh, you've, you've thrown me. My, I was going to make a point around um, the institutions and, and the effect, effectiveness of them. Um, the DP will continue to to take their stand around that, and it, like it's not a new thing. Uh, Shame as well. Whenever I was doing some reading up, and it probably had slipped my mind. You know, in back in the day, Seamus Mallon resigned as first minister because he was unhappy with um, the goings on within the assembly. So it's not a new thing. It's a mechanism that is there. And, and it's readily available, and it has. It has been effective in actually getting the UK government uh, to act. But I'll bring you back, and there's my final point, Chair, to uh, John Hume, and you spoke very glowingly about him uh, this morning, and I know you, you and many, uh, and indeed we all, hold him in, in high regard for his efforts over the years. In 1985, he said that the bedrock of peace and order, the bedrock of justice in every society is consensus among the population and how it's governed. In 1998, he noted that only the most extreme and self-deluded believe it is possible to govern without inclusiveness. Only by incorporating everybody into the decision-making process can we build stable, democratic and legitimate institutions. So it's not fair to say, well, do you know what, the DUP, take it or leave it, in or out. Well, sorry, I don't understand that, because um, I think what John was talking about was inclusion. Mm -hmm. Who's excluded the DUP? Well, I can tell you who's excluded the DUP, the DUP themselves, in the same way that Sinn Féin excluded themselves for three and a half years. And you talked about it being an effective tactic. It is not effective. For those people who come into my constituency office every day of the week who are waiting five and six years to see a consultant, not effective for them. A quarter of our population are on a hospital waiting list. It's an absolute scandal. You can have your discussions with the British government as much as you want, but the impact of that is real, and somebody needs to tell you it's real. It is real for the people who are being left behind as a result of the DUP's position. Now, if you have a position in politics, you have to own it, and you have to own the impacts of that position. And I am telling you, the impacts of that position is the destruction of the NHS in Northern Ireland as one thing and many other things as well. You have got more or less everything you asked for in the Windsor framework. I mean, do, do you know what people really think? I'll tell you what people really think, why the DUP are going into government. They don't think it's anything to do with the protocol. I don't know what the real reason is, but I think a lot of people think it's because there's going to be a First Minister from a nationalist perspective. That's what people think. And I'm not saying it's my position, but I'm telling you, when people stop me in the streets and Derry and everywhere else, they think. They just don't want the nationalist as first minister. Our party leader sat in the same chair as you did and, and outlined that that, that that wasn't the case. Well, well we let's have her elected then as first minister. Um, all I would say is you, you need to be real with people that actually, if Stormont was back up and running in the morning, waiting lists would still be the same. Um, you know, you look well, I mean, at, so I, I've been a very vocal critic of the DUP and Sinn Féin delivery you in government. At, I still think it's better that you'd be there than not well, there. You may be critical of the DUP and Sinn Féin in government, but you only look at your own ministers um, uh, who, who governed over the likes of infrastructure in the last number of years, and certainly some of the decision making there is, Which ones? is questionable. Well, I, I, However, I don't think we necessarily need to do a, an autopsy of the past. Yeah, well, I, I do think it is important that you are realistic with constituents that if Stormont was back up and running in the morning, there is not the money for the for the transformation that is needed to transform our health service. We're just not bothered. So it's important. Is that the position? No, seriously, is that, is, that, is that the position? We it's very hard, so we're not going to bother. So I think I'm asking you the questions. That. Well, I'm going to In relation them. to uh, devolution, we, um, support devolution. We, um, yeah. Are, it, it's a warm enough day as but it I is. Think, I think it's important that people realise that, and, and realise that Stormont being back up and running is not a silver bullet and will not take the health care waiting list down f uh, the five years that has existed for, for many years. We need transformation and we need our government here in the UK. So I think it's time for the parties uh, to, to step up and, and back our calls for transformation of, of the budget in Northern Ireland, as well as getting political well, I mean, and uh, Well, uh, just so you know, what's a new position for the DUP, because it's a position the SDLP held many years ago and the DUP opposed. But 
leave that aside uh, for a second. These arguments are the same arguments that I ha heard from Sinn Féin reps for three and a half years when the DUP were, and all of us were screaming at them that they need to get back in the government because the implications for the public are huge. And Sinn Féin said at that time, oh, well, you know, it's really hard anyway. We won't be able to, we won't be able to make all these changes. That's not politics. That's not democracy. If it's hard, of course it's hard. We all know it's hard. We're all prepared to help. And I've said, even if we're in opposition, we will support radical, unpopular changes to the health service if it brings better outcomes for people in the longer term. So we're prepared to do these things. None of this will happen if we're still asking civil servants to make decisions that they've no power or democratic authority to make. So, I mean, I just don't think you, members of the DUP can sit legitimately after three and a half years of criticising Sinn Féin for not going back into Stormont and then making the same arguments as Sinn Féin made at the time. Doesn't that up? Carla, that's, that's, people aren't believing this. Uh, now, I have to say, what a really interesting conversation, wasn't it? When the meeting started, Colm Eastwood said something that really spoke for me when he said this. The problem, Jim, in terms of trying to satisfy the DUP concerns, I think, around the protocol and the Windsor framework is that a lot of us aren't really sure what you want. And then he says this as well. But there comes a moment, very soon I think, that the British government are going to have to say to the DUP, you're either in or you're out, because this doesn't make, like, I mean, what, what more do you want? And I think the Windsor framework was a victory for the DUP, and you should take it and run with it. A bit where he said about not really knowing what the DUP actually want spoke for me for quite a bit, because I still really don't know what they want either. But is he right about the DUP where they should run with the Windsor framework and be happy with it? Let me know down below. And if you want to watch the full meeting, I'll have it uploaded later up today. Or if you want, I will uh, leave it in the description box below for you to watch now if you want. If you enjoy the video, give it a good like as it all helps. And if you enjoy all things that are House of Commons and select committee meetings, it's all I do. So subscribe and I shall... Just leave the video here and until the next time I shall bid you farewell and take care my friends.